And I'd like to welcome everyone to today's uh, webinar, uh, learning how to do that very tricky employment mediation. We have some high-end, very experienced employment mediators with us and employment attorneys, and we're going to get some really good information today. Um, please note, I will make sure you get their materials and attendance certificates within the week or within a week or so. And uh, we will be um, happy to answer any questions you all have later. Questions will be taken in the chat, by the way. Um, I would like to turn it over for a minute to Melissa Gorin, who is with Judicate West. Melissa is the um, as marketing and development director for Judicate West, and she Judicate West has graciously sponsored this program today. So I wanted to turn it over to Melissa for just a minute. Thanks so much. And yes, we're so happy to be able to support Contra Costa County Bar Association and sponsor today's MCLE webinar. Uh, Judicate will be celebrating our 29th anniversary this December, and we attribute our growth over the years because we've been able to retain top tier neutrals. We have a great company culture and an experienced team of ADR professionals. I've been in the ADR industry now for almost 14 years, and I can tell you that at Judicate West, we're constantly striving to be a trusted resource for you when you're doing your due diligence to select the right neutral for your case. So we're happy to share feedback, give you insight on our neutrals, and really help introduce you to some maybe that you're not familiar with, and making sure that it's the right neutral for your case. Um, Another quick point, virtual sessions are still very popular and we have virtual experience specialists available to ensure everybody's technology is working properly and also just to greet you with the warm, friendly face. And in addition, we're still providing each party with food service credits on the day of your virtual session. Um, but we are starting to see an increase in live sessions. So we're excited for the opportunity to see you in person again soon. Um, thank you again for allowing us to sponsor this webinar. You have a wonderful panel of speakers with a wealth of knowledge and even one of our very own neutrals, Jeff Owens B. So I'm excited for you to see what they have prepared. And with that, I'll turn it over to Maggie to make the introductions. Thank you, Anjali. Okay, Maggie. Thank you, Melissa. And thank you to Judicate West for being our sponsor today. Um, I'm Maggie Grover. I am currently head of the employment law section for Contra Costa County Bar. And we are looking for members for next year. So if you are out there and are interested in joining our leadership, please send me an email. I'll be sending an email out to the entire section in the next couple of days, uh, trying to, to uh, remind you that if you're interested, you need to get back to me. Um, our panelists today are an amazing group. Jeff Owensby is currently a mediator with Judicate West. I had never met Jeff before this morning, and I got to tell you, I liked him instantly. He practiced employment law for 37 years, and then he got smart and decided that he didn't need to be an advocate and walk around with a, a sword and shield all the time and use his skills and looking at both sides of the picture and helping uh, people to resolve their cases. He's currently building a home near the Canadian border. So he may <laughs> not be around for much longer. So grab I'll him while around. you can. Grab him while you can. Um, our next panelist is Jocelyn Burton. Jocelyn has been practicing employment law for approximately 30 years. She is, started her practice as a big at a big firm, I can talk, um, and now has her own law firm in Oakland. She is a very fierce advocate, I know from personal experience. Um, and in her spare time, Jocelyn loves uh, musical theater. Jocelyn will be playing the plaintiff's uh, attorney today, and the plaintiff is being played by Marta Varnegas, another attorney who has her own law firm. Marta is a former chair of the employment law section, has served on the Contra Costa County Board, and is our resident thespian, can cry credibly at the drop of a hat. <laughs> and the role of defense counsel is Michelle Ferber. Michelle, again, has her own law firm. Everybody is a high achiever here, leadership. Um, and Michelle has had her own firm for seven years and is just now in the process of opening a Los Angeles office for that firm. Um, and is an avid Pittsburgh Steelers fan. So 
you can boo at her when you want. <laughs> Think of her when they're in the Bay Area. And our last, um, sorry, the pop-up scared me. Uh, our last panelist is Anjali Karyane. Anjali is also a refugee from big firms, but instead of joining her own firm, she became the senior director and employment counsel for First Republic Bank. Anjali last week had the uh, opportunity to be part of a flash mob, and in her spare time, she does hip hop dancing. So we've got a really great group for you today, and I'm gonna turn it over to Jocelyn and Marta at this point. Okay. Um Maria, thanks for 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 uh, getting on on the on the Zoom call today. I'm I'm here to talk to you a little bit about the mediation and and get us prepared for it so that we we can hopefully be very successful and 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 and, and resolve your case uh, tomorrow. Um, so let me start by telling you a little bit about what to expect. Um, I know I sent you a little little video about mediations, and let me tell you, uh, Maria, have you ever done a medi uh, mediation before? No, I'm completely new to the legal process. Usually, we resolve disputes with the help of our pastor um, in the church, and most of my friends are from there, so uh, I'm completely new for this entire process. Okay, so why don't we think about your pastor as the mediator today when you when you go in tomorrow, and he's going to help us resolve your dispute. Now, one thing um, that you should know is we in, in employment mediations um, we frequently don't have what they call a joint session, and a lot of mediations they meet together and then they separate. Uh, they meet together for a long period of time and then they separate. In our mediations, we, we start out, generally in employment cases, we start out separated. So we may have a brief introduction with the mediator, maybe all together, and then he will immediately go into separate rooms. So one of the things you should think about is bring some material because there'll be a lot of time. He The mediator may be in our our, our room for an hour or so, then they'll be in the other room for an hour and we're sitting around waiting. So- uh, well, I always have my uh, uh, Bible with me. So okay. you don't have okay. to worry about that. Okay. So the other thing we should talk about is one of the things I like to do is we, we spend some time talking about the strengths and weaknesses of your case your damages, and we come up together with a game plan and a strategy so that we know exactly what we're doing. Now, this is gonna feel really odd to you. Um, one of the, and sometimes um, mediation doesn't feel good for, for my clients and the plaintiffs. I mean, I'm used to it, but Often what happens is you're you're feeling I, I I how do you feel right now? How do you feel about going into this process? I'm very nervous. Um, but I prayed on it and I um I understand that this is going to result in a in a good outcome for me. Okay. So one thing that happens is, you know, during the mediation, you're going to, it, it will bring up a lot of things for you that happened during your in, in employment. And some of it will not make you feel really good. And, and, and you're going to revisit some things that may be painful for you. And unfortunately, in employment cases, the only thing that we can do to resolve your case is to give you money. And, and somehow, sometimes that feels a little incomplete for people. And the other things that may be problematic, and, and you've got to keep in mind that this is part of the process. We're going to start out with a number that, you know, that's way up here. They're going to start way down here and we're coming down. And it's not like I think your pain is worth less, but it's just part of the process. And they're going to come up. And at first, the first offer they're going to give you may be insulting to you. But remember, there it's it's there's a little bit of gamesmanship going on here. And they're going to come up and we're going to come down. 
but don't feel like we're diminishing your pain in any way by doing that. It's just what we, we, we're going to do. And hopefully we either get to a place where we both agree or we get to a place where the mediator thinks he can get us to agree or at the very worst, we realize um, it's gonna be a much longer process to get to an agreement. So the other thing that we need to talk about real quickly is what is your damages? Um, and there are basically three types of damages that you can get in an employment case. One is compensation for wages. And that can be comprised of two things, back pay and future pay. Um, I've, Cal, you told me earlier that you're, you were out, you've been out of work for about three months, correct? Yes. And about $22 an hour, correct? Yes. Okay, so that's approximately, uh, I counted at approximately $11,600, okay? Um, the other way, the other um, element of damages is future pay. And that's, it, it's usually, it's generally not awarded in cases. I mean, it's very difficult to get in cases. I mean, what you have to be able to establish is that you your your wages in the future you you will suffer diminish diminished wages in the future or you won't be able to work in the future because of what happened to you in this job or because you lost this job mm -hmm. and and there are a couple times when and let me tell you why I don't think you're likely to get that in this case is because you're in a you were you were working as an administrative assistant, and those types of jobs are generally easy enough to get. And uh, you're not you're you're at an age where you can probably get another job and make up the difference in what you were making. And um, et cetera. So I'll give you an example of cases where you might be able to get future wage loss. Suppose you were a bus driver in a really small town with one bus line and you lost your job and you were 60 years old. Now the odds that you would get another job driving a bus or making as much money as you were are not very great. And therefore that you're likely to get future wages in that part, case. The other part is, um, Punitive damages. I I don't necessarily see this as a punitive damage case, and it, it it's hard to get punitive damages. And punitive damages are to punish the people on the other side, and it basically has to be behavior that's so horrible that it sort of shocks the conscience and is malicious. And here, since the company did do an investigation and did try to mediate things between you, and you you left, you didn't they didn't fire you. It it might be a tough sled, and I don't even know if we could get past. We would even get those claims to court. And then the third thing, and even though this probably is emotional distress and pain and suffering that you had as a result of what happened. Um, and, um, and even though that's a big part of what you experienced in a mediation that doesn't end up being what drives the settlement, unfortunately, because, uh, I've tried a lot of cases and I, you don't know until you get to trial what well, until you get a verdict, what, 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 if anything, you're going to get in emotional distress. It really depends on some things that I can't evaluate right now. One, what I wouldn't be able to evaluate till we get to trial. Who's on your jury? The second thing is, I know you. You're a very likable, compassionate person, but I haven't met anyone on the other side. I don't know whether a jury would like them, dislike them. And, and unfortunately, for better or for worse, a lot of your punitive damages is a lot about 
who they like, who they dislike, et cetera. So, mm -hmm. so the, the thing that tends to drive your settlement is gonna be that hard number, which is the back pay. So in our I, I also have to have attorney's fees. Right, because I right. have you and you, I mean, I can't tell how wonderful you made me feel when I came to you. And I just, I just, I didn't want to go to court. You know that I don't want to go to court. And you took me um, under your wing and rebuilt me and, and prayed with me. And I just, I can't tell you how much I, I really want you to get paid. I think you should get, if I get $11,000 and you get $11,000, I'll be happy. Okay, that sounds okay. that sounds wonderful. So it, it sounds to me like we should try to aim for settling this in the range of, of maybe $25,000 or so. Well, I, I don't think that that would hurt the company as much as they hurt me because they they did treat me horribly. I just, I can't even believe how, like how can they like make me sit down with them, man? And then you just you just said that they tried to mediate, but they made me sit down with him in the same room, and he was stuck next to me. I just I could happen. I know, Mary. I I, I know. I know. I completely. Now they are going to say that. I, I I I understand. So why we're here, is there anything that I can tell the mediator that would help you get through this tomorrow? Is there anything particular we need to do? Hold on a second. Okay. Take a minute. <laughs> Well, I I think the mediator needs to know where I come from. That I I have such faith that this will end well for us, you included. I I prayed on it, and I and then I opened the Bible, and there was this verse. And it gave me tremendous solace. It says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his sin. <laughs> so I, I believe that this is going to be really good for us. And I will finally get it closure for all that this stuff so, so maria let's work on getting you that crown um okay, okay? so i'm also very angry i'm frustrated I'm, it's been it's been months and, and i have you know trouble paying my bills well, for my children. well, I know that's why we need to concentrate on trying to get this resolved tomorrow if we can, so that you can, you know, continue your job search and 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 we can we can go forward. So one quick question, a couple questions. It, 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 would it be okay if we try to try to try to get in that $25,000 or so range. I know we can't punish, we can't punish them. You know, they're a big corporation. Even it, they're not going to feel, I mean, first off, like I said, punitive damages are what you get for punishment. And we're, we're, we're not in that range. Um, so if I can possibly if we could aim for $25,000, would that be okay with you? That's not where we're going to start, but that's where we would probably try to. You know, end. I, I trust you with this. You're the lawyer. Um, you know what's the what. Um, okay. I I trust you. 
I trust you with this. I have faith that whatever is that I am due, uh, the Lord will deliver it onto me. Okay. Um, and and, and this then... will the Lord will deliver it onto the company too, because I yeah, I have to trust that this process will result on all the wrongdoers being punished. Okay. And I, I I believe that I have faith that the Lord will keep me in his heart and um judgment day will come the, it will come for them it will yeah you know i've okay. always believed i've always believed that the universe takes care of evil doers and i don't have to spend a lot of time doing that and i think god will take care of that for you so if we can now i need to talk about where we're going to start and then we probably should end um, suppose we start, I think we need to start under six figures. I generally don't, but, uh, I, I really think it's important. We try to resolve your case to tomorrow. So how would you feel if we started around between 80 and 85 tomorrow? Thousand. I, I, if you think that's where we should start, that's, that's good by me. Um, okay. it's okay. not. It's not the multiple six digits that I think would hurt them sufficiently. Um, but I also don't want to go to court. It's it's against my faith to take my problems to um, to Caesar when I should take them to the Lord, you know. Okay. All right. So we have a game strategy and... Um... And we'll have plenty of time to talk during the mediation. And if we have you have any questions, let me know. And if we have to switch gears at some point, we'll we'll do that. But right now we have a basic strategy to go into our mediation tomorrow. Okay. Okay. Thank okay. you. I feel fortified. Okay. Um, by Great. this, and that we have a strategy makes me feel much better than I felt last night when when I started praying on this. So thank oh. you so much. I really okay, do thank appreciate you. you. Okay? okay, thank you. All right, bye-bye. So, so as one of the uh, commentators said, Marta, you have Mr. Calling. Jocelyn, you did a masterful job in handling that bundle of nerves. And uh, so now I'm gonna turn it over to Michelle and Anjali for their prep. Thank you. Anjali, how are you? Doing okay. How are you? Good. It's so nice to meet you. I know this is your first week on the job as uh, as the HR representative and the person with the decision-making authority uh, for tomorrow at the mediation. So I know it's not a lot to di digest. I'll try and make it as easy for you as possible. Thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm really feeling um, unsettled here. Um, with this issue, you know, I, I really don't know what to expect. I am somewhat up to speed on how this issue was handled, but as you know, um, there were some gaps in the process in terms of um, what we did in our investigation. And I'm really feeling a little bit nervous um, about how the mediator is going to react to some of the information that um that we're going to be telling him sure so good news is that this is a pre-litigation mediation so there's been no complaint filed no discovery exchanged we're, we're both sides are in the same boat i haven't had an opportunity to assess the credibility of the plaintiff and uh, likewise they don't have all of your documents to know the depth or the experience level of the people performing your investigation. The good news is that an, an investigation was performed. Um, there was a determination made of no sexual harassment. And I think we leave it at that in, in a general sense and focus more on if there is a way to bridge a gap monetarily to reach resolution tomorrow. Oh, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, there are some gaps, but... I don't think this is a case of liability. I don't think the company has any liability here. Do you think the company has liability? Well, let, let me put it to you this way. There is potentially liability in any case that, that 
that is brought for sexual harassment under the Fair Employment and Housing Act in this state in the sense of attorney's fees in terms of liability to you as the company, you're paying them, you don't have insurance. So is there financial liability? Yeah, you can consider that a cost of doing business. So then let's look at what the potential liability to the company is um, for this claim. These claims go away, as you know, by one of three ways. You settle them, you try them, or we are lucky enough to be able to file a dispositive motion that says there is no chance, even if the facts alleged are true, that the, the claim will survive. We know that she's got claims here of, a, of, of someone with power asking her out, going to drink alcohol. We know that she felt uncomfortable about his mannerisms behind her at the desk, asking her to take off her jacket when it was warm. So there is certainly a factual possibility since we have to take the plaintiff as she is, that these were reasonably offensive to her um, and caused her to be feel unsafe or experience unwelcome conduct in the workplace. Even if we value that at a very small fraction, we know that even if she were to be awarded just her, her loss of pay for say three to six months, what it would take her to get a job, she would get attorney's fees on top of that. Plus the time it would take for the company to pick people and resources away to participate in discovery. All that being said, there's an opportunity here from a pure business point of view at some sweet spot, which we haven't discussed yet, that it might make sense to get this away tomorrow if we can. And so that's where I come out on it, advising you as a, as a corporate wide for the whole company, this is a case that if we can resolve, we should. If she comes in with a number and doesn't move from a number that's into the six figures, that's too high, then we know we tried. But let's put our best foot forward, see how low we can get it, see if it's a number that makes sense. And if nothing else, we learn something at a mediation because we'll learn more about the plaintiff, more about her claims, more about opposing counsel. But aren't we making it too easy for her? I mean, she hasn't even gone to court yet. I would think if she really had a strong case, she would go to her an attorney and she would file with, you know, she would file with the agency and then file a complaint with the court. I mean, isn't this a an attempt for her to be opportunistic and get some free discovery and then figure out if they have a claim or not? Sometimes. I don't like this whole pre-litigation mediation thing. Right. I, I hear you. And sometimes I think that's true. And sometimes that this may be just a fishing expedition, which is why we're going to be careful. And we'll talk about that in a second, about how much information of our defenses we want to reveal and when. But there are times I have found that there are single plaintiff harassment cases where it is much more important for the individual who has felt this pain in the workplace to have a venue or a stage to tell their story. It's either going to be a judge or a jury, or it's going to be a mediator. And if th this is the kind of plaintiff we have, which it, it sounds like in terms of her, the type of her complaints, her sensitivities, that she may need an opportunity to have someone hear her side of the story, show empathy, but then be able to then move on with all she can get, which is money. That's the only way to resolve the case. It's money now or it's money later. Yeah, I mean, she resigned and look, we don't know. She might be working somewhere else. Well, right. And that's a question we can certainly ask the mediator because we haven't had the benefit of discovery. It's a perfectly legitimate question so that we can base damages. The second thing, they don't know what we know about her, right? They don't know that we have a witness who still works for us who says that um, she actually did go to happy hour with people and um, had an alcoholic drink in front of it, of her. So there may, that, there may be a point where we're close enough that we say to the mediator, okay, you can use that information in the other room. It's going to be very important and it's going to be your decision along the way. Everything as want to remind you that is said at the mediation, whether she files in federal court or state court down the line, is protected by federal and state 
um, mediation privilege. So what does that exactly mean? She can it, use it in court only or she can't use it? Who can can't she use it in court? You can't use and the fact that there was a mediation, what numbers were exchanged, what what statements were made, the mediator cannot be a witness. None of that can come in, in into evidence. Now, you can't unring the bell. If we allow the mediator to go into the other room and say they have a witness who says this, or they say that your social media has pictures of you at a pool in Hawaii with you know, a Mai Tai in your hand, can they use those statements? No, but can they craft discovery to get our backup for it? Of course. So we wanna be careful and tell the mediator, this is information we have. We're not yet authorizing you to go to the other room with it unless you and I, through the course of the day, feel like we're really at a place where it's a serious mediation. I mean, we could probably pull up the Facebook stuff now and show the mediator. We could show him what we right. have. We can and show she, the mediator she but know? With, with the caveat that it's not to be repeated to the other room without our permission. So we get to give permission. We get to limit yes. the scope. Right. And most mediators will say, though, this is very important. The scope's wide open. I'm telling everything in the other room what you've said, everything in your brief, unless you tell me not to. Okay. So that's going to be important. So let's talk about negotiation strategy. Going back to this plaintiff, Maria, needing her time to speak, it may be that the mediator spends a lot more time in the other room. You've got a business interest. She has a personal interest. Um, Brett's not here. They didn't want him here. They say they're not naming him. So he doesn't need to tell his story. Um, although obviously we have him on, on backup, like we talked about, if the mm -hmm. mediator wants a few minutes to assess his credibility, we'll make him available on the Zoom. Um, because the mediator may spend more time in the other room, you and I will have more time to talk, but you shouldn't take his being in one room longer than us, that he's not listening to our side of the story any more or less. It's just, um, it, it can vary. The other thing to remember is we're going to get a high demand. Okay. It's going to start high. That's just what happens. Because it's not just a negotiation. If I could sit down at coffee with Jocelyn, the attorney on the other side, and just negotiate a deal, that's different than mediation. Mediation is a process, and we need to let the mediator do his job and go back and forth. We can't just cut to the chase and get out of the room. It just never works that way. So don't get upset if that number is, you know, into the six figures. Okay. Okay. I've had cases that are mid I mean, six figures and then settle for, you know, $20,000. That happens. It may not happen, but we have to trust the process. And so okay. for that reason, don't say to me, yeah, Michelle, put the whole $15,000 I've authorized you in the first, get it done. Just offer the 15. No, if I, if I start out too high in the face of a large demand like that, they're going to think our, our midpoint is, is something different. So it's a numerology game. The mediator's in charge of that. And just try not to let it frustrate you, although I know it will. <laughs> I'll follow your lead. Okay. Is there anything else that questions that you have about the process or any of the facts? No. You know, I know what the facts are. I know we did an investigation. Yeah. There might have been some gaps, but it was done by a highly qualified HR representative at the company. And at the end of the day, there was no wrongdoing. I mean, the, the facts in this case, I think they strongly um, favor us as the, as the employer here, taking prompt remedial action. We um, talked to Brett. We advised him as we thought was appropriate, which was appropriate under these circumstances. I mean, I, I, I'd be shocked, I'd really be shocked to hear if the mediator thinks that um, she's got a case. Well, there's two sides to every story, right? And I, I, if, so if I'm sitting in the mediator's shoes, which I'm not, and understand that when I'm defending you, my eyes are blinders, right? You get 100%, I believe, everything in what we did. 
But when I'm talking to you, I'm going to point out that those small gaps we talk about in the investigation, which they are probably not aware of at this point, so we're not going to raise them, um, there's not necessarily contemporaneous notes. Not all witnesses were necessarily thoroughly um, spoken to. And there may have been some delays because not while you were there, but because while past people going through transition, people were not easy to reach. And this probably took longer than it should have. Okay. So those are true facts. The other thing that's true, that's always true from my perspective, is it never hurts for a company to have empathy. It won't hurt you for the mediator to hear and see that while you don't think the company did anything wrong, you're still sorry that this person who worked for your company feels this way, that that's her truth and you feel badly about that and you'd like to do what you can to resolve the situation. It doesn't mean that it's an open checkbook. It doesn't mean you agree that this was the right way to go about remedying a situation. It's unfortunate that she walked out the door and just quit and didn't give the company the opportunity um, to correct its mistakes. We don't want to go too far with that because I don't want you to hire her back. <laughs> Rehire is not on the table. Am I correct on that? Yeah, you're correct. So, you know, the goal, if we're going to make a business decision is to take a deep breath, recognize that litigation is not fun for anyone. And if we can resolve it tomorrow, we should. And know that we gave it our best foot forward. Kayla, so, I, I feel like we're in great hands. Um, you know, and that's why we have you um, on the front line for this one. So I will, I will defer to you um, and we'll go from here. Okay, great. Last reminder, don't, don't talk numbers in front of the mediator. Okay. Whenever he says, do you have a response or do you need a minute to talk? We always need a minute to talk without the mediator. Got it. Even if we both know what we think we're going to say, I'll do the talking on the numbers. Okay. Great. You've got my number if you need anything before tomorrow, and we'll see you then. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Obviously, another skilled uh, presentation of how to deal with a client that's not quite sure they want to be in mediation. And now Jeff is going to uh, come on and talk about what he might like to have seen or what they did right um, from his perspective. Jeff? Thank yes, thank you. First of all, let me hand it to all of the participants. It's incredibly difficult in the compressed amount of time that they've been offered to give a sense of what it is to prepare somebody for mediation on either side of the case. And I think they did an excellent job. I um, wrote down several notes during the respective presentations. And I'm gonna go through them in rapid fire, if you don't mind, given the compression of time that we have remaining in the session. So one of the things <clears throat> that neither side talked a lot about that I spend some time doing in the intro is talking about the neutrality of the role of the mediator, um, that I don't have a horse in the race, that I will say things in your room that may be a reflection of my candid evaluation, that may be a reflection of arguments made by the other side. And I think it's fair for the lawyers to say, <clears throat> and some mediators um, at times sort of emphasize things in an effort to infuse doubt in the case and therefore press the parties towards resolution. So I think talking about the role of the mediator, tactics of the mediator, neutrality of the mediator, and particularly if you know the mediator, <clears throat> talk about how that mediator gets the job done. I think that's a fair game. And it takes a little apprehension out of the parties as they enter the process. Um, I think if I'm on the plaintiff's side of the case, um, I might spend some time talking about the constructive discharge standard. Now, given this particular plaintiff um, and sort of the way that she is viewing the case, her apprehension about going to court, uh, the strong moral and religious convictions that underlie her claim, talking about technicalities in law is going to be a difficult dialogue. But I think that the plaintiff needs to know that a constructive discharge case is fundamentally different than a discharge case. 
And I think the plaintiff needs to understand that and think about that before they arrive at the session. Because if I'm the first one to talk with them about that, um, that's a bunch for somebody to swallow and understand in a short period of time. I think both sides were focused on the merits of the case. And for, in some measure, I think it's important that the both sides learn a little bit about juries and sort of the, the truism that there's a relative inability to accurately forecast how a jury is gonna to react to a particular case. I mean, juries are human beings and they are fallible. And we can talk about generalities and the likelihood that they'll accept certain arguments and the like, but any trial lawyer that's been down the road a few times has doubtless been disappointed with how a jury reacts to a certain case. And that truism, I think, should be introduced to the parties, particularly if they get really righteous about their position. And it occurred to me the dialogue written on the defense um, side of this argument, we had a sort of doctrinaire HR uh, official and that's fine, you know, that she's proud of the effort of her colleagues to investigate and evaluate and remediate the case to the extent they could. But there is always that, how will the jury react to these facts as a different question than what does the law teach us about how the jury should react to the claim? I'm gonna talk about it. And I think both sides would benefit from hearing about that in the intro. <clears throat> I think also on the plaintiff's side of the case, you know, there was a, a very strong emotional reaction to a lot of things during that short period of time. And I take my hat off to Marta's uh, skills in presenting that emotional lability. But <clears throat> the reality is, I think that counsel might wanna talk with um, the, the plaintiff about a jury's reaction to that form of emotional reaction. Is it too much? Is it is it effective? Is it truthful? Does it come from an honest place? That's, you know, those are questions the jury is going to think about. But there's also going to be, if it's too much, a jury might have, or at least some of the members of the jury might be off put. Did you want to say something, Maggie? Okay. Um, then the next one that caught me was, you know, the citation to scripture and the crown of righteousness. I think since there is such a beautiful correlation between that plaintiff and that plaintiff's religious uh, viewpoint of the entire matter, if there'd been more time, it would have been lovely to explain that this is clearly not where that question is gonna be adjudicated. Neither the mediation nor a jury trial is able to perform the job that, that she believes will occur uh, when facing the creator. This is 12 people and they have a different perspective and they're instructed the standards by which the case is to be judged. And I think the plaintiff needs to understand this, the sharp dichotomy between what a jury is gonna be thinking about versus divine judgment. <clears throat> Punishment. Punishment is a strange thing and, and plaintiff's counsel did a beautiful job, I think of explaining that the likelihood of a recovery of punitive damages in this case um, may be difficult. But on top of that, awards of compensatory damages, general damages and specials are by no means uh, the kinds of things that most people regard as punishing a company. It is an economic exchange and it's the best our legal system has to offer. And I think counsel did a nice job of highlighting that but this isn't a place where punishment will be overtly meted out either in mediation or at trial. <clears throat> um, and the idea of taking one's controversy to Caesar versus the Lord, you know, that Genesis of that, you know, in scripture, no pun intended in reference to Genesis, but, but bluntly um, the judicial system is all we've got in the system of law. And this is her place to have civil justice, not sort of global justice as she might anticipate, you know, if a pastor were evaluating it, or again, at judgment day, how the parties will be treated uh, in response to their entreaties to enter paradise. 
we only got money damages here. It's a, it's a poor substitute, but the, the plaintiff has to understand that that's all there can be in the civil court system. And that's the limitation of the system, but it's also the best thing we've ever been able to invent for the adjudication of wrong. Focusing a little bit on the defense um, prep session, again, excellent job. Um, there's a question, what do we do? Do we admit those places where we're vulnerable to criticism or do we not? Do we hide them or do we wear them on our sleeve, accept them and move forward? Clearly a question is different or the answer is different depending upon the phase of the case. But I will share with you that in a case where I was defense counsel you know, 10 or so years ago, the lawyer on this other side was a big bad wolf and he was very, very skilled. And uh, going into mediation, I had a $10 million demand. And we had a joint session uh, in which I confessed all of the things that we did wrong immediately in my opening statement, not admissions of legal liability, but things that we thought could have been done better. And we were able by virtue of copying to that, both to the plaintiff and to the plaintiff's lawyer um, to have an earnest dialogue throughout the rest of the day and the case resolved for about a million bucks. Um, and I think there are times when an admission of shortcomings establishes credibility and deflates some of the hostility that might otherwise be targeted back against that party who makes those admissions. Both in leads and in mediation, I would uh, urge counsel to spend time with their respective clients on the theme of don't bury your lead. If the plaintiff's case is fundamental about touching and words and uh, you know, sort of ghosty images of a torso behind glazed glass and a request to go out and, and get to know each other and have alcohol. If that's the center of that case and the reaction to it, get that on the table in front of the mediator as quickly as possible, both in your briefs and in your presentation. Don't bury your leads. And on the defense side, if it's, this was much ado about nothing, if it was, you know, perhaps unpleasant to her, but not objectively offensiveness, or if on the other hand, it's, it's they have other defenses, they should get those out and boldly on the table right at the outset so that um, those things have a possibility of sinking into my head um, as I'm listening to the rest of the story. Um, the value of catharsis. So there, in this case, it's pretty darn clear that both sides needed catharsis. The plaintiff wanted to make sure that I understood that, that she was hurt, that what hurt her. And on the defense side, uh, that I understood that they did a great job of reacting to complaints of harassment. Um, I think both sides needed a chance to tell their story in order to sort of get them off their soapbox and have a candid discussion of the objective value of the case. Confidential inf Yes, ma'am. Are you trying to? Well, I, I do have a question here. And, and Please, if other rip. people have questions or comments, go ahead and chime in. Um, one of the things, and I think it's probably because the presentation was so truncated, that neither of them really talked about was what it looks like if they don't settle, what the next step is and what the yeah. hard road is. Is that something that you prefer to have counsel talk about before something you talk about? What, where's the best place to bring that up? Yes. <laughs> so I think, I think um, candidly and truthfully that those, those orientations to context should come both from counsel and I will certainly mention them in most cases if we start to reach impasse. Um, there's always you know, the cliche uh, parade of horribles that mediators throw at somebody either to close or, um, or to further a case when it appears that mediation, or pardon me, that impasse is imminent. But among them is a realistic sense of what this is all gonna be about. And the plaintiffs, particularly, since they're so wrapped up in their claims and have, they are the centerpiece of the claim or the claimant or plaintiff side presentation at trial, 
they have to understand how much work is going to go in to the process between the day of mediation and an eventual trial. And also the lack of finality, even at trial, if there are post-trial motions, if there are appellate actions and the timetable for that, I think the sides have to understand that. And from the defense perspective, the identical chronology leads to dollars bleeding out every day during that extended chronology. So I think your point is very well taken. I think the context of where the mediation fits and what happens if we don't settle is critically important for both sides to understand um, and helps them shape what their tactics are gonna be. And I think the defense did a beautiful job of talking about, um, on the defense side, talking about empathy and understanding the position of the other side, even if the law or the facts in totality don't necessarily support a big recovery. I mean, so often the cliche reaction is uh, the defense comes off as heartless and unable to understand the other side. And I think they don't give themselves their due because quite obviously they're human beings and they get it and they can zealously argue the facts in their favor in the law. But for them to acknowledge that, you know, we can at least understand how somebody in her unique position might take offense to these things. Um, they don't have to take an extreme position to the contrary. They can talk about at least her subjective or their comprehension of her subjective reaction. Those were the things that came to mind as I was listening to the prep sessions. And I again, pat the folks on the back for both the, the client side and the lawyer side in the amount of time they had and the fact pattern given, they did a very nice job. Does anybody else have something they wanna add, Marta? You're muted. <clears throat> Well, I just wanted to add what I added in the in the chat that every line I spoke came from one or more of my clients just for you on the defense side to understand what plaintiff's attorneys deal with on a day in day out basis and often they come at the same time um, saying that I don't want to go to court but I want you the magical attorney with your magic stick and your just pull out that bunny from the head that will perfectly punish this bad actor who hurt me so much, but I don't want to go to court or I don't believe in the legal system or I don't want my lawyer to get paid. I don't want to pay taxes on the money mm -hmm. I am getting. So all of these insanities often come out from just the sheer anger of a plaintiff. And I'm like, I only have the hours I put in in this race, no other special dog. I'm just trying to do my job. So calm at that, please. But but every sentence I spoken, and there were more yesterday's in prep session with Jocelyn, came from true quotations from true and actual clients. Name shall be unnamed. Well, it, it was, it, you aren't the worst client in the world. I mean, you, the, you didn't come in and say, I, I want, I don't want to go to court, but I want $500,000. Yeah. Oh yeah, because I prayed on it and I think this case should settle for $500,000 and I'm not gonna, you know, if it's four ninety nine nine, dollars I'm not doing it because I prayed on it. Yeah. And you know what, it's as crazy as it sounds, sometimes it works out for the client and I'm like, well, what do I know? You know, I'm just an agnostic sitting here trying to do my job with my fancy keyboard. One thing that no one mentioned, and again, I'm sure it's because it was truncated, we as attorneys have to advise our clients in writing, and there's a standard form for it, of the limits of mediation confidentiality. We will be sending out the standard form so that that's part of the package that we will send out along with the fact scenario. Um, well, one and, thing we did with Jocelyn is that we this was the second session, you know, like as she said, I already sent you over the video and talked to you about this and that. And yeah, because there's just, it's impossible to prepare a plaintiff in one session. Most of the time I do two, three separate conversations about mediation, sometimes even like just mentioning mediation very early in the process that we will try to mediate as early as possible. So they kind of understand that they might not get a day in court. They might, that might not happen that 
the day in court is going to be on a Zoom with a mediator. And I hope that the, all the mediators are going to be as nice as Jeffrey was understanding that, you know, this uh, plaintiff was speaking a special language or speaking of tongues, if you may, um, because um, oftentimes these, they just go way over unreflected by the mediator. Are there any um, questions from our audience? You want to type them into the chat? While people are doing that, one thing that I would, for me, that's been missing in these mediations for, I don't know, five, six, seven years, and sometimes bring value, especially pre-litigation, is to have some sort of a joint introduction session, not to advocate and to put forth your positions, but to let my corporate or HR or insurance representative see the plaintiff who hasn't even been deposed yet. I may not even have met in person or ever seen opposing counsel. I, I, I just think that lack of connection sometimes makes it a little bit harder. Um, and I, I, I do agree that when it gets a too adversarial, it's counterproductive, but I would just put that into it goes into my mediation preparation at this point, if that's a possibility, so that people have faces, so that it's human. I would, I would comment that you would not believe, Michelle, the amount of pushback against either joint statements or even sharing briefs that I face nowadays. And my own personal perspective is, if you're going to spend all that blood and treasure preparing a brief and to let it sit in me, that I have to be a secondary salesman for your rhetoric. What a squandered opportunity. And you'd think that I was proposing something revolutionary by either shaking hands with the other lawyer, at least getting to eyeball the parties or sharing briefs. It's, I don't get where this comes, but it also explains why there's mediation now, because if the lawyers are that fundamentally distrusting of every other member of the bar and every person on the other side, that they won't share a brief or shake their hand, then you know the, the bar has itself to blame for the advent of the mediation industry. It was unnecessary when I was a pup. I mean, you get on the phone and you work it out, but we gotta share information to get cases. Well, yeah, up. You have to be stronger with your clients because you can share the brief. And if there's some one or two things in particular that you just don't wanna share, do a side little letter on that. There's a way to solve that issue. Absolutely. Yeah, well, I, I always, go ahead. Well, unfortunately we've gotten to the point where you can't even talk to counsel on the phone anymore. I mean, it's all email and, you know, and I, I think find, find that's unfortunate. It, to me, sometimes it takes twice as long to resolve an issue than it would be if you just picked up the phone. Yeah. One of the things that I say in mediation to convince my client to, uh, to, allow me to discuss the facts is say, you know, I'm going to tell the mediator this really great fact for us. The mediator is going to go in the other room and go, there's a really great fact for them. But if the mediator can't say what it is, opposing counsel and their client's going to go, uh-huh, sure there is. Yeah, you know, the, I can only do with what tools you give me the job that can be done. You know, I mean, if you're brief and your oral presentations and the way that you carry yourself and the presentation of the parties is strong, then I got something to work with. But, you know, keeping everything behind a cloak is defeating to the to the process. Jeff, do you use pre-mediation conferences with counsel? I do. You want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. Usually um, it, it doesn't focus on the generalities of the case, it focuses on those parts that the lawyers consider to be essential to the case. So I asked them about those things that they think their entire posture is founded upon. The other thing I talk about is, are the right people in the room? And that particularly pertains to defendants. Do the decision makers really have autonomous authority to make any deal at any hour? And if not, how are we going to get this done if we lose connection to you know, the holder of the actual purse who may not be part of the process? I talk about insurance. I talk about reservations of rights. I talk about stuff like that that might be impediments. For governmental entities, I talk about their approval process for proposed settlements and the timetable for doing so. Um, you know, I try to get behind the case to get 
roadblocks out of the way because we'll talk about the case and the merits when we all get together. But I try to make sure that at least we're going in with everybody on the same page and, and maybe break down some impediments before we ever start. Very often, PAGA, class actions and the like, financial viability, you know, pops its head up, you know, maybe shortly after you start in a session. Well, if the party claiming um, that they're insolvent doesn't have all their financials, their bank uh, uh, account statements, doesn't have their tax returns, doesn't have all of those things that might allow the other side to test that assertion, the mediation will fail or at least result in a second session. So I try to get that kind of stuff out of the way. Okay, we have a question from a participant. Generally, the interactions that the client sees with the mediator, are the mediator trying to bring them up or down towards the other side? I've had clients insist the mediator is against them and start to lose trust in the process. Advice on how to keep the client trusting the process. And anybody who wants to chime in on this, you've all got experience with this. Anybody so Jeff, wanna... do you want to start? Sure, I'm st I'll start. I think the one of the things that I try to do when I'm talking about numbers is I make sure and attribute them to the other side. I don't make them a value judgment of Jeff being articulated in the session. The other side says, the other side asserts. Um, they claim, you know, I try to maintain that neutrality by expressing the view that's articulated in the other room, but without putting an endorsement behind it until such time as I have enough rapport established that I can then start telling them my view of things. The reality is, is given the posture of many lawyers in mediation, uh, they don't want me to know the truth and they don't want me to know their, their ceiling or their floor. And I have to always assume that everybody's sort of hiding the ball from me. Um, so one of the reasons I don't make statements about my value judgments about the case, it impacts my subsequent efforts to make a mediator's proposal should that opportunity arise. But secondarily, um, I don't never convinced I really know the facts or the truth, despite both sides trying to lead me to their view of things. Well, one of the things that I would have done had it been longer is, you're right, I didn't really talk about constructive discharge. We did in the pre-session the other day, but I, I try to let them be very candid about the strengths and weaknesses of the case at the pre-mediation. So they're not hearing it from the first time from the mediator, so they don't end up hating the mediator. Yeah. And the second thing that I, I usually do, one thing that I do when I'm selecting mediators is I, there are certain mediators I pick for certain types of clients. Absolutely. And there's some clients who, you know, there's some mediators who can relate really well to, you know, low income, uh, you know, clients who are hourly workers. There are other mediators who relate far better to, you know, six figure tech people in Silicon Valley. I make sure that when I choose a mediator, it's somebody who's going to try to relate to my client. I think that makes a huge, I've had mediators who are only talking to me and the client's looking at me like, well, what am I, chop liver? It, it, it doesn't work. And I think that that's important from my perspective on the defense side. I am always on my clients. Well, why do we want to use that person? That's who the plaintiff suggested. Exactly. You hold the checkbook. So at the end of the day, the case doesn't settle unless you write the check. So if the plaintiff feels that there's trust in the mediator and that plaintiff's counsel thinks that that's a good fit for the client, then I'm not going to nix it unless it's one of a very few mediators that I just won't work with. So that takes a lot of convincing going in. And then, so most of the time, my clients don't have any expectations about the mediator, no matter what I say, they think they're in the plaintiff's camp, and then they're generally pleasantly surprised. So that's, that's my little secret opposing counsel. You can, oppose, you can recommend your mediators. But I think it works a lot better if the plaintiff is comfortable in these employment kind of cases with the mediator. Particularly in a shortened session. I mean, when, when I'm given the impossible assignment of doing a half-day case, if one side is recommended and the other side is okay, 
it's just short circuiting your way to get it to an analysis of the case. Good thinking, Michelle. I okay, have Marta. a, I have a, a little bit different perspective from Jocelyn's. I feel like my credibility is at issue if I'm nudging my client and when I'm representing plaintiff, eventually it's going to come and bite me in the butt. So I go out and and I usually tell this to the mediator in the pre-mediation, like meet and greet that, look, I will have you deliver the bad news to my client. So I can be just sitting there nodding sadly and patting her shoulder, but I need you to beef up my credibility. That is what I see the mediator's function is because otherwise I would be able to pick up the phone and settle the case. But I feel like I would not serve my duty to the client for zealous representation or whatever else the bar wants us to do. And so far, that has worked out really, really well. I, I tell the client where I see weaknesses, but I don't tell the client how I see those weaknesses affect the money. Like I, I'm like, this is going to be difficult to prove. This is going to be difficult. These are This is gonna be an issue this is what they will say this is what if I were defense counsel this is what I I would write my motion for summary judgment on but I'm not going going in there with the money and I'm letting the mediator do that money talk and and I don't think that it has hurt the client trusting the process or the mediator but when I try the other way around it hurt the client's faith in me and I I treat that as sacred and Martha. I think one of the things that you can do at that point is look at your client and say, this is the mediator's job to try to bring us together. And the mediator is really aware of what your options are. And if we don't get it settled today, this is this is what the next two years look like for you. And so if it's a matter of on the defense, uh, paying more money than you want to, what is the business decision here? You have six figures of defense costs, even if we win this case, uh, and and that's unfortunately a fact of life. Um, we are right here at closing. Jeff, I cut you off a little bit. Do you want to say one more thing? Yeah, I think one of the ways that all lawyers can use a mediator is to make sure to tell them what it is that your purposes are, obviously, to settle. But if part of my role is to be an educator or to buttress the opinions that you've put on the table or whatever, let me know that. And an effective way to do that to me is ask me questions on the central issues and I will give you candid answers. And um, that way, if you think I'm not taking full advantage of the opportunity, then you can coach me into doing so by asking me the right questions. So I wanna thank all of our panelists. I'm sorry we lost Anjali, but Jocelyn, Michelle, Marta, and especially Jeff and Judicate West for sponsoring today. Thank you all for attending, and I hope you found it to be educational. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Gotta hydrate now. All right, thank you. <laughs>
Oh, well, may, well, maybe because so, it's a rare occurrence. But anyway, no, I that, that was my thought. And, you know, I've done a couple. I, I just did one against Jocelyn. Oh, gosh. How did that go? Uh, my side went fine. Oh. <laughs> but she had she had husband and wife. And my client, in my humble opinion, paid too much to settle husbands. And wife wanted an equal amount and wife just didn't have the didn't oh, have the that good of a case how do you have an and, employment case with a husband and a wife well they both work for the same small business oh okay and they were from my client's perspective both um they they'd done well for three years and then they would continued working for more than 10 years and <laughs> relying on inabilities <laughs> Oh, uh, so anyway, that's life. I will actually, I may be able to, if I can get the spinning wheel of death to stop, I may be able to get you the documents in the next 20 minutes, but I, have, oh, I have to leave in 15. Okay. Don't worry about it. I'm not going to get to it today. That's a, okay. That's Great. a next week thing. So just to soon, right. soon though. Okay. Yep. Thank yes, ma'am. I don't want you. you to forget. I know you don't, but just, you know, I know you got a lot going No, I on. wake up at two o'clock in the morning going, oh my God. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I know the feeling. And so. All right. <laughs> Ciao. Thank you. Bye.